Okay, uh, so hello again. Also for those on YouTube, we are beginning with the last panel of the day. We will hear papers about peripheral featuring of street art, technological advances in street art practices. We will start with Elena Calderon Alaez, independent researcher of graffiti and street art. She graduated in conservation and restoration of culture heritage at Complutense University of Madrid. Uh, she was active member of the group Street Art Conservators at TEIOF Athens. In 2017, she finished a master's degree in conservation and exhibition of contemporary art at UPV in Bilbao. She is currently part of the Street Art Cities community. She also is a part of Urban Art Con Observatory and is based in Tokyo from 2020. She will talk of timeless graffiti, more spe specifically on street art of, or graffiti as pieces of NFTs. So, Elena, I hope you can hear us and please, the stage is yours. Uh, Elena, turn on your mic. We can't hear you. Okay, now? Sounds good. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so yes, good afternoon, konnichiwa from Japan. Thank you to the Street Art Ljubljana Festival for letting me be part of this conference. A few years ago, I was living in uh, Maribor, so I had the chance to visit also like Metelkova and the area. And uh, I would love to be there right now, but unfortunately it's a bit far, so Anyway, thank you so much for having me. And my presentation, it's uh, the title is Timeless Graffiti and NFT Market. Um, I'm gonna talk about platforms that sell street art as NFTs and the formats of how they sell it. Uh, a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I've been researching graffiti and street art for eight years. I'm from Spain and I'm graduated in conservation and restoration. Uh, I've, uh, I've been member of Urban Art Observatory that maybe a few of you knows about it. And I published some articles in Mural Street Conservation and I've been documenting street art for a long time in street art cities. And I also documented some murals from Maribor so I think it's interesting from this festival, so you can check it out in the street art cities. And I'm based in Tokyo since uh, 2020. I'm currently working as a curator for Totemo team. Um, I wrote uh, an article for uh, Sabucaro online magazine in Japan with my research that I've been doing for the past two years here with some uh, graffiti writers from Japan, and you can also find it in their webpage in Sabucaru. And um, I was also planning to do the conference in Lisbon, Urban Creativity Lisbon. And I saw that the topic for this year was uh, this uh, liminality concept from uh, Arnold van Gienep in his uh, book, Rite of uh, Passage. And I think this concept was really interesting and perfect to describe the new practice of selling this kind of uh, graffiti and uh, street art pieces as NFTs. And in the past uh, few months, uh, a lot of uh, platforms uh, monetize this type of artistic expression, selling it through the blockchain as uh, non-fungible tokens. 
and without having in account their origins as this type of practice, which we consider like graffiti as a kind of ritual practice. So we say then like selling an a mural, selling an NFT is only like animating a mural. So that it's carrying out legally and curated. We think that uh, in that way, like in this example that you can see now, lose all meaning from the graffiti and lose the ethos of the street arts. And most of these platforms, they only sell murals and they're not focusing on tags, throw ups, stencils, stickers, or other forms of graffiti. In our platform in Totemo, uh, we have these three phases that Arnold van Gennet was talking in his, uh, in his book also. And these three phases, uh, we consider in uh, the graffiti as a ritual technique. So the first uh, phase is the pre preliminary phase that is carrying out in the urban space and is capturing videographic and photographic documentation of the process and the final piece. The second will be the intermediate phase and is the, an event with live art and live performance where clients and visitors can experience and enjoy um, this creation and could be both indoors or outdoors. And postliminal or third phase is the animation of this piece and the minting process into NFTs, into the blockchain. Um, in this event will be the place and the moment, the space and time that allows this passage between one social condition to another. That is between underground and collectors, between urban and blockchain, physical peace and virtual peace, ephemeral to eternal peace, and the public space to the private space. And this is a, a video from our event that we had in March in Tokyo. And well, it's uh, a bit long, so you can check it out in our webpage, but I will put you a bit of it. And in this event, we had live auction, live arts, and the people could experience with the artist itself, the creation of the piece. And well, you can find it in our Instagram or our Facebook page. And therefore, considering the origins the, of this almost ritual practice of the graffiti, what will be the main weakness and opportunities of this emerging technology, selling and collecting street arts? And what is the position of the artist facing this new form of feminization of their work? What meaning can we give is if it as art researchers and professionals. It seems that the advantage of uh, some platforms is to convert these expressions ephemeras that disappear due to vandalism, weather conditions, or the destruction of the support itself into eternal and immortal pieces into the blockchain. But we think that this is another of the reasons that characterize urban art and in some way romanticize it. The artists choose the urban support, knowing its conditions, and therefore play with the temporality of their pieces. They know that they will disappear in a short period of time. So do these artists uh, agree in that so their pieces become immortal and eternal? And another, on the other hand, some artists find in the blockchain a new way to live from their art, and to expand their creativity and recognition in the art world. Here we have some uh, advantages and disadvantages of this kind of uh, NFTs. Advantages will be like documentation that from my point of view as a conservator is really important with new techniques, the geolocation of the pieces, to live the experience and capture this artistic, artistic process, including also sound that is important in the NFTs and reach larger audience and new ways of monetizing with secondary sales. 
And the disadvantages will be the intellectual property if the artists are not agree with this selling. Uh, the opposite movement, because it's not public and accessible and free anymore. The marketplace is not that trustable yet. And the difficult access to the new technologies that I will explain later. These are the three innovation associated with the street arts. NFTs that decentralize certificates of authenticity, resale royalties for artists, and the ability to trade and collect digital art, the three main points. Other platforms that they are doing this also, that I found some of them, are Volcanda, Street Lab, Particle, and Artflow. In Volcanda, for example, we have this uh, image that they do like animation of mural. In a street lab, they are from Mexico and they also say this, that they can be destroyed, these pieces in real life, but they will be here forever on the blockchain. Uh, here they show how it works and you can find it in their webpage. And in particle, they took one of the pieces and they divided in 10,000 NFTs. So the collectors can collect each of them. So it's another like different approach of it. And they made this opening party selling one of these pieces of uh, Banksy to attract like street art collectors. And this is art flow. And you can see also like this kind of animation of a mural and they are using also um, in the metaverse online art galleries. And they have big names also like, for example, Deface. And these are some of their animations. What could be a graffiti NFT when we talk about it? Could be an animation of movement of a current physical piece on the street, could be mural or tag, animation in 3D from the physical piece, total animation related to the street art world, pixel animation art, virtual reality games with a character or an avatar, video of the physical real piece with a location, or video of the execution of the physical real piece. And here there are like a few examples that I found from all these formats. This is a, one of the most interesting ones from uh, the street artist Kiri because he used the 3D piece, also adding sound from the physical real piece and he adds the coordinates of the piece and the location. So it's really important because it has like all the differences. Sorry for the sound. And yes, they are like really interesting uh, projects that he's doing. Also, this collective uh, of bees from Istanbul, they are doing really nice animations from related to street art. As you can see, some of them have sound. Hati Hati is also doing like really interesting animations. More related to graffiti, traditional graffiti. In pixel art, we have, for example, Diego Bergia that is doing this. animations related to graffiti and NFT world. And he's been doing works also with uh, Katsubot. <laughs> with this uh, drawn animation with his, his.
This is one animation from a uh, Snipe One that it's a graffiti from uh, Tokyo. And he painted in this track all his char characteristic throw ups and uh, tags. Paradox from Germany is also doing really interesting animations of his letters and also these drawn videos where you can see the location where he uh, put his letters and his pieces in Germany. The house in Berlin that they, they did this uh, collection and they destroy all the rooms. They are selling now these rooms, the scan of this room. For example, from this uh, rock on his brothers. Good guy bodies, for example, it's uh, selling these NFTs with the drone video so we can see the location of the piece, for example, in Meteora. One up is also selling the process of his their pieces as a video from the capturing the moment when they, where they paint in the street. Neck face is uh, selling this like a scan from a real piece. Some of them they are not uh, selling as NFTs, but I think it's like a good idea to represent how they capture the moment of painting it. This is a good example of virtual gaming with Avatar. Uh, it's a graffiti artist from, uh, from Tokyo, Akiwon. And these are more videos from Process from uh, graffiti artists from Japan, Mosu and Wanto, capturing the moment. Bon True Love, really interesting too how he create these 3D animations like tagging. And finally, ah, Ben Ein also with his characteristic typography, he's also starting to sell NFTs. And finally, this is uh, one of my favorite ones because he's combining the process, capturing also like the context where he's painting and a bit of 3D scan. So he's combining like almost everything in the piece, final NFT piece. So what we need right now is like uh, uh, from our side, a bit of education on how to teach people like collectors and artists, how to purchase NFTs, create their wallets, display them, and to the artists, how they can create these NFTs. So that's what we do with our uh, startup and this was a really interesting survey where they ask um, here, like, what does it make like a good art NFT? And 88% reply, like, it's important and a strong artistic concept. So curation is like really important for us. And for example, Murakami, Takashi Murakami is doing tonight a really important NFT show event in Tokyo, and they will have lectures explain uh, how you can purchase an NFT and what is an NFT. So this education process is like really important. And this was uh, funny from the survey because people that buy NFTs, they don't even know how to access it. If you can check here, like 67%, they, re they reply that they bought it, but they don't even know how to display and how to access to it. So my to summarize, it's uh, NFTs could be a new artistic moment. We don't know yet. We will see in the future. Maybe it's just a trend. But uh, for the moment, we have this documentation that it's really important for us and for me, as a conservator and restorator, it's really important to have this process also 
in the videos and documentation, not only the final pieces, but also the location from the piece, the technique, the materials, that it's something fundamental for graffiti because we consider it as a ritual expression. And that's all. Palalepa, thank you so much. Thank you, Elena. We will continue uh, with uh, the next paper by Lilia Naradosevic, art historian in researching graffiti and street art since 2000. She's the curator of the first VR exhibition of Belgrade's graffiti and street art and part of the street art Belgrade team that made the project Art in Passage dedicated to blind and visually impaired. Today she will talk about that. Her paper is titled on the outskirts of the periphery, street art for the blind. Liliana, I hope we hear ourselves. Yes? Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, since we already have it, I'm just gonna go forward with uh, my presentation and to show uh, what we did uh, last year. So, um, I'm part of the Street Art of Belgrade team. Uh, we are an association that deals with researching, documenting, and promoting graffiti and street art. And our main project is called Urban Heritage Hub. As a part of that project, uh, we produced this uh, first VR exhibition about Belgrade graffiti and street art, which is called Loving Street Art Belgrade. And I had the pleasure of presenting it at this very conference last year. And also as a part of that project, we did this uh, three mo 3D models for the blind and partially sighted people in Belgrade. So the name of the project is Art in Passage. It has dual meaning. It can mean uh, like you are passing by the art and also that you can find an art in underground passage, for example. So we've been uh, trying to get some funding for, for this project for several years. And we finally managed to get it in uh, 2021. So this first year, we produced three models. And second year, meaning this year, 2022, we already did five models and we expect to do another one by the end of the year. So in next year, our idea and goal is to produce the, the mural that is actually dedicated to the people that are blind and partially sighted that will include already some 3D elements uh, that they can enjoy tactile in a tactile manner. And uh, we'll see how we'll manage to do that, but we are hopeful. So uh, when we talk about uh, the idea that we had, um, our aim was to make graffiti and street art available to blind and partially sighted people. So this was basically uh, we were coming from our standpoint of people that deal with graffiti and street art, and we just thought that we needed a wider audience, some more people to understand and love these uh, different visual expressions. And uh, actually what happened was that through our process, uh, while working with the people from the City Association of Blind and Partially Sighted, we realized that, uh, of course, even though our, our idea was very positive and it was very appreciated by them, they might have needed something else from us. And then we kind of ended up being the activity-based advocates of, of their causes. And this is how we actually switched from, from um, our original idea to actually being um, social activists. <laughs> so these two murals were the first ones that we've decided to make. Uh, the starting point was that uh, these are characters representing wolf and a giraffe. They might be relatively easy to make and uh, might be uh, tact in, on a tactile level more understandable to people that are blind and partially sighted. And so when we got our funding, we started with the project. Of course, uh, our colleague, actually, Sergeant Tunic, who presented at the first slot this morning, 
who is also a very good um, a person who, who makes the, the models and he's very good at it. Uh, he did these ones uh, on your right hand side is the first one he did. And we took it to the association and they told us like, okay, this is very nice and all, but we actually don't really get what is it. So then surgeon actually took upon himself to make another one. So this one was more 3D while the other one was more on, uh, on the lines of bas relief. This one was more 3D and he tried to separate this um, worm-like uh, segments of the, of the artwork so it could be more understandable. Uh, presentation like visuals yes i have presentation let's constant see we can see them. Uh, let Share me screen, yes i'm sorry apparently <laughs> to, today is day full of um full of uh technical issues i'm sorry about that Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. I let me just um, yeah, you should have told me at the beginning. Let's just go quickly. So these two murals, these are the ones that we had in mind when uh, when we wanted to do this. And so this is the uh, the process. So after the second one was made, we of course took it to the association and then again they told us that uh, they don't really get the point. So then we started thinking how can we adjust it more for them to be more understandable and, and uh, to, to make more, more uh, sense to them. And we thought of uh, making them more sim the sim to simplify them uh, which would, of course, make the original artworks um, kind of uh, less uh, less interesting. And it was a huge downward spiral because we were thinking too much. And then Nicola, the president of the association, told us, like, yeah, you don't really need to do any of it. Because if you have artistic presentation of the, of the giraffe, then just explain that it's an artistic representation of giraffe. So then it kind of clicked like, aha, that was so simple, but why couldn't we think about this? So uh, then we took all these um, models and photos uh, to the firm that made 3D models for us. And we were very happy with, uh, with the job they did. And of course, we again took it to the to the association and they were also super happy with it. And it was like, okay, finally, like we have a starting point. And uh, it was uh, complex. This production was complex on the level of the materials that they used as well, because this um, colorful parts that we see in these two photographs are um, made by color jet 3D printing, which is apparently the most common printing, uh, 3D printing today. Then when we needed to make uh, the part, this kind of a, a slate with, um, with the Braille uh, alphabet, they needed to use this stereo lithography, SLA, because that one is more precise and when you do dry, you really need to be precise. And then we had the third technology used, which is uh, fused deposition modeling, FDM, which is basically melted plastic, but I'm gonna tell you more about that one later. And then our second challenge was uh, with Bry alphabet. So of course they use, um, typing machines, the, the one that you can see, the green and red, which I think looks amazing. And then, of course, they're using the, the Braille printers. But our major issue here was that you don't really get a Braille alphabet in digital form. 
because everything is translated to the regular Roman alphabet when it goes into computer. Once it's in the computer, everything is in Roman alphabet, and then it can exit as a Braille alphabet or regular Roman alphabet. But uh, in digital format, it's like really hard to get. Of course, there are some systems, but here in our association, they don't really have it. So when the time came for us to deliver these descriptions to the firm that was producing 3D models, they, uh, we, we brought them a piece of paper with Bry alphabet with the description and they were looking at us as if we were mad and they were like okay what are we supposed to do with this and it's like yeah we have no clue you know this is what we have you know you have to deal with it but they were really wonderful and they scanned it and uh, in that process they also did a proper research uh, about for example diameters of the dots and um, distance between the dots and distance between the the letters and the words. And of course, you, th there is a standardized system that you have to use because if you make it larger or, or smaller, they won't be able to read it. Or for example, if something doesn't fit in your row and then you put it in the next row, it just doesn't work for them. It has to be exactly the way they gave us. So this was like the second part where we had to negotiate quite a lot with the firm and and to see how things will, will develop and how they function. But at the end, uh, people from the association were actually really impressed by the precision with which these Bry descriptions were made, because they say usually people uh, just think, they find something online and think that's enough. And then when they try to produce something for them, but never really asking them in which format they need it in order to actually really be useful for them. So as you can see from these two examples, uh, we had a lot of things to deal with. Uh, nothing really appeared to be as we thought it was because we kind of imagined the old project from our standpoint and none of us has a problem with our site. So uh, many issues we didn't really anticipate, again, because we never dealt with this kind of issues. And we kind of really ended up looking for different kinds of solutions along the lines, along the way uh, of this project. And it was really a learning curve, like around every corner we had to figure out something new and learn something new about uh, how the things are really functioning and what is really useful for the blind and partially sighted people. And uh, we ended up with two huge things that kind of marked our switch from, from an idea to this activism that I described before. And the first thing was that we um, realized that they're not really... Um, kind of using the space independently. They always need an assistant to walk around the city. So this was a, a huge discovery for us because we know they have these trainings to, to use uh, the city independently, but they apparently never do. And uh, our first idea was to make all of these models monochrome because it doesn't really make any difference for them. But then we realize, yeah, these things need to be visible so that people who can see and actually encounter these plates on the streets can rethink the way they park on the street, can pick up after their dogs. And the city firms that actually dig up the craters in front of their buildings and don't really mark them properly so everybody can you know, fall in and break their necks. Uh, to re rethink this public space as a space not only for people that can see, but also for the people that are blind and partially sighted and have other needs as well, like people in the wheelchair or even like mothers that have that walk around the city with strollers, the same issue. And uh, the second thing was that uh, while working with them, uh, we realized that they were really grateful that we actually thought of them in presenting them and get so they can get a, a, acquainted with something that they never knew before, like street art, 
But um, this project actually made so much media fuss and we were constantly present in the media. When I say we, I mean the, the president of the association, Nicola and me, we were constantly like for more than a month, we were present daily on three or four different um, media in, in Serbia. So they said that this was like a really huge thing for them because they're not present. They don't have the space to, to kind of say what they need and promote maybe some of their projects. So we were thinking like, okay, now that um, we can actually do it, this is going to be our main goal. So we're going to give you media space. And then when we got possibility to do a second round of, of um, our 3D models, we were actually approached by the local food producer and they said that they really liked our project and they wanted to, uh, to kind of help us continue with it. Uh, we chose our murals in a completely different way. So we aimed at the, the most important and most popular artist in the Belgrade, uh, very colorful artworks. We wanted them to be uh, very visible on a daily level so that everybody can approach them. And uh, we definitely wanted them to be um, more visually appealing than what we imagined you know, in the first round. And uh, so we got these kind of, uh, this new set of five uh, 3D, mur uh, 3D uh, prints of the murals. And of course, uh, they uh, started uh, media fast all over again, and we were quite happy about it. But uh, that was just like an added value because the main aim was to actually stimulate blind and partially sighted people to explore their environment uh, on their own, independently. So we tried to um, find these murals that, that I mentioned uh, in the vicinity of the association, because everybody goes to the association, so they're kind of uh, having once a year these competitions in independent um, orienteering uh, in, in the public space. And all of these murals are five to t 15 minutes uh, walking distance from the association. The second thing is that, of course, we realized that our premise that they will just walk around and be motivated to go and touch our, the touch the models of the murals and just experience something different was completely wrong because we didn't have all the information that we have now. So we've decided from the very start to produce these cheaper versions uh, of, of the 3D mural models, uh, cheaper version of 3D uh, of models of the murals uh, so they can have them at their offices at the association and everybody that goes to the association can actually experience them and have um, description in Bry, uh, what they represent and where they're positioned and so on and so forth. So this is our story, how we actually started presenting street art and then ended up being the, the activists. And I think we're still doing it now and we plan to do it as long as the media are interested so that we can give them more space so they can actually um, be more visible and uh, ask for what they need and maybe somebody could actually listen to them. Thank you uh, for, for listening and yeah, see you later at Q&A se session. Thank you very much. We continue with Enrico Bonado and Siri Helen Egeland. Uh, they, uh, Enrico is a teacher and advisor in the field of intellectual property law who focuses on copyright protection of non-conventional forms of creativity. He has recently edited Cambridge Handbook of Copyright in Street Art and Graffiti and is currently working on his monograph, Penetration of Copyright into Street Art and Graffiti Subcultures. Siri Helen is assistant professor at the University of Agder in Norway currently working on PhD titled Issues on Copyright and Moral Rights 
in the intersection between visual art, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality, a comparison between legal regulations in the EU, the UK, and the USA. This is the whole title. Uh, they will present street and graffiti art between augmented reality and artificial intelligence, a copyright perspective. Here you go. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the introduction, the presentation. We are really happy to be here, although virtually would love to be, the love to be with Rubinia with you, but uh, uh, it will be for the next time. So this is a, a paper that we we with the uh, city we have worked on and uh, uh, is about to be published uh, uh, in a law journal in America. And uh, what we have done basically is to try to assess the legal consequences from a corporate perspective of certain uses of graffiti and street art in these platforms, right? Both augmented reality and uh, artificial intelligence, creative artificial intelligence platforms, right? So, in the next slide, uh, we will see uh, some, you know, we can play, I, th I think, you know, see, we can play? Um, maybe, yes. <laughs> let's try, let's try. We need the audio? But still, even without audio, we can see the effects, right, of uh, augmentation of, of this. I, 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 this is in Tel Aviv. So you can see that using these platforms, you can adapt, recreate, uh, interact with existing, uh, with existing art on the walls, on the urban surfaces, right? So it's quite it's quite an impactful way of of of, of, of working with street art. In the next slides, uh, we can we can go uh, uh, we can go further. We can see uh, I think it's another video, but we can skip that video I think because we already we already played the one video. I think it's enough. Uh, let's go to the. Uh, the we have played this. Sorry, uh, sorry, it's just uh, we can't go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Yes, I mean, and then there are other other ways. I mean, um, uh, Pokemon uh, in the in the Pokemon video game, uh, there are already been uh, complaints about use of graffiti. Uh, one, in one of my interviews, my, my interviewee, a street artist in New York, uh, complained about the fact that uh, her mural had been included in, a po in, a, in the Pokemon uh, platform. So these uh, can enrage artists quite, uh, quite uh, heavily, I would say. Uh, so uh, Gangsy, uh, the Gangsy platform is another, is another one uh, which uses the style of the famous British artist to, to create a new new images uh, based on, uh, on Banksy's, on Banksy's uh, uh, works. Uh, okay, what to say about the, you know, the impact of these platforms on, uh, on copyright, right? Because artists have rights, as we know. They have rights. The right to prevent others from copying, right? The, the, the mural to adapt the mural and uh, to communicate, to make available to the public the mural, right? Uh, so basically the street artist is given a set of rights which the, he, can, he or she can use to, to, to stop unauthorized, unwelcome users of, of, of their art. On the other hand, not all, not all users can be prohibited. I mean, there are some uses that the people in the internet environment can, can, can rely on to, to use these works, right? Okay. To create others as, as a springboard, as a creative springboard for, for, for the creation of far street art. We have seen that in the augmented reality platforms, there are people who interact with existing murals, right? By creating basically another artwork, criticizing, citing, the previous the, the mural which has been incorporated. Well, these might not be always infringing, right? 
the same goes with the, the moral rights. Now, the following is lies, where uh, this is another set of rights which is, uh, which is uh, given to, to artists, all artists, the right, the right to oppose unwelcome use of their you know, murals, of their, of their pieces, which are prejudicial to their honor or reputation, or the right of attribution, right? So the right to be uh, recognized as the author, the artist, the creator of that particular piece. These are important moral rights. Uh, I don't know, Siri, you want to go ahead with, with the following? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, another thing that we looked at is whether, you know, derivative works uh, created by AI or, or AI technologies can attract new and separate copyrights. Um, both of these technologies are uh, data processing technologies and uses data to create new works. So the latter pieces, therefore, derive to a greater or lesser extent from the works used to feed the platforms in question. Um, and, you know, as a, as a general remark, uh, the creator of a derivative work or downstream creation needs the authorization of the owner of the copyright over the original work, the upstream work. Uh, absent, which copyright infringement could happen. Um, as to derivative works made by AR and AI technologies, uh, the fixation requirement is uncontroversial, we believe, as they are recorded in a tangible way on digital support. Um, but what about originality? And this is where um, we found the biggest discussions and maybe the, the biggest differences between the jurisdictions that we um, investigate in this article. Um, on the one hand, you have the common law approaches uh, that are more um, lenient, I suppose, towards uh, the idea of a fresh copyright being attracted to a derivative work in this kind of media. And then you have the more conservative approach from um, the EU um, law. Um, the problem with this, to give a clear conclusion of these derivative works, is that the, the analysis will always be fact sensitive. And this is also something that we've seen in the uh, cases that we have used. We haven't found any cases directly linking um, AR, AI and street art, but there are, are some cases touching on to um, this um, subject and all of them are fact sensitive. So that it's difficult for us to predict which way a court will go in this um, discussion. Another thing is that, you know, street artists themselves uh, can benefit, as we have seen already from the wonderful presentation by Elena Calderon uh, earlier, um, and using these digital ways of expressing themselves as a new way of um, getting their art out to the world. Uh, already many artists uh, use uh, street pieces as spaces for um, creating um, uh, for creating um, uh, prints, etc. that can be sold. And this can also be another way of utilizing the street bound pieces for uh, artists. NFTs will also be naturally one way of further extending um, the use of augmented reality, for instance, or even artificial intelligence on an existing piece. Enrico already um, said something about the exceptions available um, to artists um, using these medium. And one of the things that we have discussed in, in the article um, uh, is this uh, exception the freedom of panorama that exists in most jurisdictions, um, at least here in Europe. And it has different um, contents depending on which country you are in. And the question is, you know, how can this be used in a new virtual world where you might see Google Glasses, for instance, or glasses made by Facebook um, uh, applying augmented filters into the real world? And should then uh, these images that are created on top of the real world be uh, available through some sort of virtual or even digital uh, panorama? We believe so, but this is something to be explored further and to be 
um, discussed in great, greater detail, but we already touched slightly on it in, in the article. Yeah, I think, I think this is the, one of the main points of our, of our research. We are already finding out that there is a digital panorama. Hmm. Because what, what used to be the, the physical panorama, now it has become also digital. We need to recognize and accept that. And therefore, the exceptions should adapt. Uh, the, the legal exception. So it's, I think it's a, a pioneering thing, but probably it might, it might get more and more attention as uh, the platform where we create uh, becoming more and more digital. Yeah, and also, you know, the, both AR and AI has to some extent a hidden, a hidden um, quality to it. So it's, um, it's very bound by software at this point. Um, and that is also something that poses a, a challenge to, you know, the discussions on the legal side, because when something doesn't really exist in the real world, as is the case with AR, um, how do you then use um, legislation that is based on the real world is it really translatable or might there have to be changes done to really encompass all of um, all of the effects that AR will have on the art community? Maybe the last. <laughs> yes, and, and these are the three points mainly which summarizes our, our paper. So first of all, what we have learned is that it's relatively easy to appropriate these forms of art by using this technology, you know, Pokemon Go and... Uh, these platforms. These forms of art are more vulnerable to appropriation because they are placed out there in the street, right? So, but we have, as a second point, we have also seen that artists, they have rights. If they want, they can enforce them. I mean, they might not want to do that, and many the subculture don't do that, but if they want to do, uh, there has been an increase in such cases recently, as we know. Uh, although there are some limits, Limits, you know, third parties can still use in some circumstances their murals for critical uh, purpose or uh, for panorama, freedom uh, rules, or so on and so forth. And also, if maybe more importantly, these platforms, augmented reality and artificial intelligence, are increasingly used to create fun, to create. Uh, downstream uh, works. Again, there are copyright issues there because uh, we need to verify whether the works are original enough from the previous one and also again a digital version of the Fido panorama uh, in this platform. So we have tried to imagine the future because we have spe speculated a lot. There are no cases, there are no uh, and therefore, we have tried to predict what probably is going to happen in the next few years. That was our intention. The paper. So we welcome comments and questions from from the audience. And our last slide is for uh, the beautiful town and Kvala. Kvala is the right pronunciation, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for your hospitality. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for the beautiful picture, though we're not so close to uh, that place, uh, but anyway. Uh, we will continue with uh, two uh, presentations of artists. If you have some questions, uh, wait please until the end of the panel. Uh, next one will be today Drolls, uh, because unfortunately Antigun uh, was not able to come, uh, though there is still an exhibition opening in the evening, which you are all very welcome to join us at. Uh, so next will be today Drolz, a Slovenian interdisciplinar interdisciplinary artist and creative coder who works in the field of electronic music, computer-generated audiovisual composition, and other forms of intermedia art. Today he will present us his project, Laser Graffiti. Today, the stage is yours. Uh, hello, hello. Um, you hear me? I, I assume that's uh, yes. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I, 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 um, I'm uh, doing uh, lately a uh, workshop called uh, Laser Graffiti, and I'm not really a, a graffiti artist. Um, I I just had basically some ideas uh, I wanted to realize, but I figured out I I lack the time and also the enthusiasm I had uh, maybe 20 years ago. So I thought maybe the best idea would be to just uh, share my uh, knowledge uh, and, and skills and maybe infect others that would do uh, some, um, some cool uh, laser graffiti. Um, and that's basically what I'm uh, trying to achieve with this, uh, with this workshop. Um, and this presentation today will be basically uh, about that. Uh, the workshop will also to, to place, uh, take place uh, over the, I think, Thursday and Friday on uh, this Ljubljana Street Art uh, Festival. And uh, yeah, I'll just click on my uh, PowerPoint and we'll go from there. So first I think I need to uh, share it. Uh, you see my uh, PowerPoint? Okay, thank you. Uh, cool. So, um, yeah, this uh, workshop is produced by uh, Lidmila and Projekt Atoll and co-produced by Kino Shishka. And um, for a start, I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, so essentially, we're using uh, computers to generate uh, content that we want to then project uh, on some uh, public uh, surface. Um, it can be also volumetric, more like in the air using uh, smoke or uh, haze uh, or just uh, the natural environment uh, that's uh, humidity or maybe pollution. Pollution can be also a very good thing in this um, case. Um, so this is uh, an image from the first uh, workshop uh, that uh, uh, took place in uh, Kino Shishka. Um, and uh, so the workshop is, is divided in uh, three parts. In the first part, we are just uh, kind of doing the basic uh, necessary boring stuff about laser safety, about technicalities and so on. Uh, in the second part, we, we create uh, graffiti. Uh, we draw them in... Um, open source software called Inkscape, which is like a free alternative to Illustrator, for instance. Um, and in that, uh, there we define all the path and the color that the laser needs to take. Uh, and we, uh, we look into all the uh, peculiarities of, of lasers, because when you program lasers, you need to be really careful how you program, program them. Uh, for instance, if you have some short, uh, sharp angles, you need to kind of decelerate before the turn and then accelerate. So this is all kind of part of, of the design. So you, you need to kind of think of, like with half of your head as a graffiti designer and uh, with another part as, um, as a, a kind of technician. Um, of course, there are different ways of how to, uh, how to do this. Um, and uh, using certain tools, uh, you really don't need to care about any technique stuff because uh, the tools do everything for you. But here in this case, we have other advantages. Uh, for instance, um, we are also using uh, audio signals to drive graffiti, which means that we can uh, sonify them immediately in, in real time, which you will also see examples uh, later on. Um, so that, that's also the, uh, uh, and then in the third part of the workshop, we go in a van. Uh, we will all, also see this uh, later on in the video. We go in a van, we drive around, and uh, participants choose their locations, where and what they want to project. And of course, we need to be really careful because lasers are dangerous. They can uh, blind people. 
and we don't want to do that. So uh, it's, it's really necessary to kind of um, consider all the health and safety issues here. So that was also part of, uh, of our first workshop. We were uh, here, one participant uh, decided to uh, project graffiti on IKEA store. Uh, she drew this uh, chair and called it Smith. Smith in uh, Slovenian means litter or garbage. She added double T at the end, so it has a more uh, uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, ring to it. So it sounds like a, a product uh, from IKEA catalog. And of course, it's, a, it's I guess, the uh, criticism of consumerism. Um, but the image is not exactly, uh, it's, it's not perfect because there's a bit of T missing, but that's another issue when it comes to uh, taking photos of, of lasers, uh, where because you need to kind of synchronize the, the shutter of the camera with the shutter of, of, of the, uh, with the frequency of drawing. Uh, but that's really, uh, maybe I'm going too far with, with some technical issues, uh, but that's kind of things we need to consider. And that's also the stuff we cover at these workshops. Uh, then we can even project on water, which I think is is, is great. Uh, but again, we can, uh, you know, the, the, the light bounces, so we need to be careful where to project. Uh, of course, again, uh, health and safety issues. Uh, as you probably realized, last Rasky Graffiti is just a Slovenian word for uh, laser graffiti. Um, then we can add some splashes to get some more volume. Uh, this was more an abstract. Uh, graffiti from from the workshop. Uh, then, with more serious lasers, you can do more serious stuff. This is uh, uh, graffiti, uh, let's say uh, I don't know if he calls it like that, but let's say laser graffiti from Joanie Le Lemercier, a very uh, kind of famous audiovisual artist. And this is a sign of uh, Ende Galende, uh, which is an uh, environmental uh, activist uh, group. And in a similar way, uh, we have here some cool stuff from Gabriela Prozacka, um, shooting some light messages on these uh, cold power plants. And then uh, another option here with a, instead of just projecting messages, you know, we can also um, add more, um, let's say, uh, uh, artistic uh, thinking to the whole thing. Uh, this is uh, some very simple installation, but I think very, very powerful. Uh, here, the artist, then uh, Rosengard was uh, projecting a sea surface over the city and uh, trying to uh, inform uh, people that this is where the sea level will be in next decades if we don't do any serious action about it. And it's, it is an, uh, this is from uh, Netherlands, uh, and there this is a real, uh, a real uh, threat. Um, then going even more abstract, this is an example of my recent project. Uh, here uh, we can just do like volumetric, uh, volumetric shapes. Of course, it's not necessary that they are so abstract as, as this. Uh, but for, for instance, in this case, I was using uh, mirror ring uh, and lasers within the mirror ring, and then uh, the bounce that light, the, uh, the light that bounces around uh, creates this uh, generative uh, volumetric objects. This is the same project. And now this is an example before I said that we are uh, using audio signals to drive, uh, to drive um, lasers. And while this can be used in, in various ways, for instance, in, uh, if you would want to um, show the effect, let's say, of, of sonic pollution, you could just put a microphone and kind of mix it in with a, with a laser signal and your laser graffiti would kind of react to all the noises around. Um, and in this case, you can see also uh, 
what can be done by using uh, sound and lasers together. Okay, I, I hope you could you could hear the sound in this video because it's uh, uh, it's really crucial to to hear uh, both sound uh, and see the image. Um, and now for the end, I want to show you uh, just the video from from the first workshop we did in, in Nashishka to get a slightly better uh, idea of uh, how everything uh, looks. Okay, uh, so I think that, that's that's kind of uh, everything about uh, this uh, workshop that I wanted to present today. As you can see, um, we, we we are having fun during the workshop. We do some nice graffiti. We have some problems and we solve them. And we drive around with a you know with a van and uh, project things around Ljubljana, and expect more of that uh, at the end of this week. Today, thank you very much. And uh, now it's time for the last presentation for today. Susan Hansen will be joining us to present a new art journal, the new issue of the magazine. Uh, by the way, Susan will be joining us tomorrow as well. So we will present uh, her work uh, in detail tomorrow. And today, let's speak about the journal. Susan, please join me. And thank you uh, very much for the nice introduction. I'm not actually hogging talk time as an individual. Ooh, slideshow, you can see my notes. Um, today I'm talking as an editor, so I'm kind of representing the work of others. Um, it's a really nice part of my job because that I've become sort of, just the slideshow, please, <laughs> an academic midwife. Uh, there we go. Thank you so much. And is there a clicker for me? May I, may I have a clicker or some? Or oh, I can just jump back and forth. It's fine. Yeah, so this is me as editor, um, and I'm really grateful to Sandy and the rest of the organising team for letting me hog 10 minutes of conference time uh, to talk about um, a journal that is not street art and urban creativity. I'm really delighted that uh, the proceedings from this conference will be featured um, in our competitor journal, uh, which is great. Thank you. Um, Pedro's journal, uh, and you'll be hearing from Pedro tomorrow morning, and hi Pedro if you're on Zoom, um, is a, quite a long running now, the longest running traditional academic journal on street art and urban creativity. I'm part of the advisory board and we have absolutely no beef, um, but this is the, 
This, this is New Art Journal. Yeah? We are slightly different from street art and urban creativity uh, in that we're a hybrid journal. Yeah? So I don't think there's really room in the field or enough of us yet uh, to have two purely academic journals, even though we're interdisciplinary in approach. Our journal presents both academic articles and visual and experimental works um, and uh, reviews and interviews with artists. And it's an attempt to kind of trick people who aren't academics into reading academic articles and to get artists to produce work um, themselves uh, for a journal that's read by a bunch of creative practitioners and curators and academics. So it's bringing our worlds together. Uh, this is issue six, um, which is on the cheesy theme of reconnection post-COVID. Um, we've since discovered that quite a few initiatives are now called reconnection this year, but never mind, we came up with it first. Um, so it's, it's devoted to exploring the ways in which researchers, artists, curators and communities are forging renewed connections with cities, projects and each other as the uncertainty and disconnection of the last two years recedes. Yeah, so it has 12 original articles. Um, one of the pieces that I think is most interesting is we have a great interview with Jeff Farrell, who's like the godfather of graffiti studies, about his new book, Lost Picture. Um, and he's asking whether we should rethink what we see as street art by considering what forms of hidden art on the streets exist. Yeah, so those of you who know Def know that he's both a professor and also a dumpster diver. Yeah, so this latest project presents a series of photographs that he's basically dug out of dumpsters over the last 20 years. And he's got a corpus of something like 20,000 photographs, most of which have not been digitised, because the, the aim of the project for Jeff is not to digitise yeah, it's to sit with these photographs and let connections emerge more organically and more slowly. And we were talking about the slowness of memory at lunchtime. And this is a project, I think, that fits with that approach um, to academic work and to sitting with images. Um, on a related note, uh, this is a piece by Adrian Burnham. He exposes the accidental and often anxious aesthetics of discarded everyday objects as captured in the evocative photography of Frank Allais. So this includes things like collections of banana skins discarded in the streets, uh, collections of like old vacuum cleaners and ironing boards. Um, he's, he's quite fastidious about putting these together and Aid has written a beautiful essay about what sorts of feelings this work evokes in us when we're presented um, with these detritus from our everyday life. Um, in the visual and experimental section, uh, we have some works from artists. Um, this work by Alexander Simpolis um, tells the story of a project he came up with during um, the last two years where he kind of elevates the status of what started as a, a tiny bit of graffiti on a sign uh, to mural level. I haven't got a picture of the finished work. If you're in for a long read, uh, Megan Hicks made me really jealous writing this article. It's the kind of like traditional work that... Um, Academics really love to do, so she locked herself in the archives of libraries for months and months and months and came up with all of these images of a really old-school form of graffiti, yeah, which is also super ephemeral. So this is like pavement graffiti. Yeah? It washes off in the rain. And we don't always have photographs of it, especially from periods of time when not many people had cameras. So she went back in time to the 1930s to look at the role of pavement graffiti um, in Australian politics and life. So that's one of the traditional articles. Uh, Lachlan McDowell um, from Melbourne is an academic and now also a big shot curator. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, he quit his academic job and the city of Melbourne threw millions of pounds at him to curate this massive festival that took over the entire city and employed, I think, 40 artists and also 40 musicians to work together. So this is kind of like a, his model uh, for curating such a monster without selling out, which is no easy feat. Um, we have a lovely piece um, on the work of Oleg Gutsunov, or OK, uh, looking at politics and process um, by curator Elisa Bailey, who's based both in Madrid and London. Uh, Enrico, this is why I popped out for a second while watching Enrico's talk. Hi, Enrico, if you're still there. Um, I have seen that talk before. It is brilliant, and he's also contributed a different piece along with Olivia Jean-Baptiste, um, again, on the implications of copyright for street art and street artists. That's well worth a read. Nearly there. Um, one of the consequences, I guess, of um, the pandemic and us forced to kind of socially distance 
uh, as we've seen today as well, is that artists were starting to use things like augmented reality um, and online environments to connect with one another and to rework the physical work they were doing. So this uh, is a piece by Agnes Michelzak um, on the work that she was doing on the streets of Cairo um, that were kind of animated with the Art Vive app. Um, a much bigger project um, was embarked on by Jan Vorman and Brad Downey. Uh, they used the virtual world of Minecraft to bring together a bunch of artists that we're used to seeing working in physical public space. Now, so Minecraft is quite an interesting place to do this sort of work because you, you can kind of walk around in an almost kind of three-dimensional fashion. Yeah, you can trek between the various artworks and, and all these artworks, most of them had a parallel in, in, in kind of real life um, as well. Okay, this is a beautiful piece um, reporting uh, on a project that was a collaboration between the artist Ian Strange, formerly known as Kid Zoom, um, and Trevor Powers, who's a musician and composer. Um, Ian is also from Perth, which is in Western Australia, which anybody who knows Australia will know was locked down in a fortress for a couple of years during the pandemic. So Ian had to come up with a project, and, and this collaboration is the result of that. And it's quite beautiful kind of architectural and sonic installation that's also a series of photographs. Okay, the final piece, or oh, second to final piece, is a piece by Ada Wiles, um, who produced a series of, of folded banknotes. Ada usually works on the street, but she also works small scale as well. Um, that kind of reflect on the resilience of refugees rebuilding their lives in the aftermath of war, persecution and natural disaster. Um, and we finish on a high note. Um, so, you know, we, we're trying to squeeze as much critical um, content and thought in as we can, as I can see is happening at this kind of conference and, and festival here today. Um, so we've published a roundtable discussion chaired by Athens-based Mirto Silampundini and Anna Karasidis that aim to foster a queer feminist approach to graffiti and street art scholarship and practice. Yeah? Um, so as we revive our collective networks, um, I think critical and progressive discussions like this hopefully will give us all renewed traction and hope, um, as does eh, the smiley face in the inside of the cover. Um, it is a lovely print object. Um, it does exist for free online as well because we kind of have uh, an ethic that knowledge should be accessible to everyone um, and that we shouldn't profit from academic journals like the other journal I work for does. Um, so you can read it for free online, but I have slept all the way to London from London with like really heavy physical copies, so if you would like one, they are in the lobby. Okay, um, I think... That's us. Oh, there's instructions on how to submit in the inside back cover too. So there is an open call. Oh, there should be a final slide. Oh, there we go. That's the most satisfying slide of all. All right, that's me done. We're at the end of the day. Okay, thank you very much. Can I keep the computer? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much to all of those who uh, came here today and to all the lecturers. Now it's the time to pose a question for the lecturers at the last panel. Maybe you have some here? Maybe we have some at YouTube? No? Uh, so if there are no questions for the lecturers, then uh, I believe it was a long day today and we can conclude. Tomorrow it will be a little shorter uh, day, so uh, I invite you all to join us again tomorrow here at 10 a.m. for the second day of the conference on which we will also see the documentary film. As far as I heard, it's only the second film on female street artists in the world. Uh, so come and see it and of course come and listen to the lecturers. I all invite you to join us also uh, at uh, 
uh, actually right here in what, like 10 minutes uh, for the graffiti tour that starts in front of Kino Shishka at 5 p.m. And also you're all very welcome to join us at 7 p.m. at uh, DUM, Dum, Dum Project Space. Um, uh, and Dobra Vaga Gallery for opening of Antigun's exhibition, Black Powder. So uh, I hope we see you again today, and if not today, tomorrow. Thank you all for, all for joining us.